An Undeceptions podcast. As darkness settled over the small German town of Vienna in the late winter of 1798, large groups of young men rushed to the town's university's biggest auditorium to listen to their new philosophy professor. They jostled for seats, took out ink and quills and waited. At the lectern, a young man lit two candles and the students saw him bathed in light. There is a secret bond connecting our mind with nature, the professor Friedrich Schelling told the students. His idea that the self and nature are in fact identical, was as simple as it was radical. He explained this by pointing to the moment when the self becomes aware of the world around it. At the first moment, when I am conscious of the external world, the consciousness of myself is there as well, he said, and vice versa. At my first moment of self-awareness, the real world rises up before me. Instead of dividing the world into mind and matter, as many philosophers had done for centuries, the young professor told his students that everything was one. It was an idea that would change the way humans think about themselves and nature. That reading comes from a New York Times essay penned by historian and author Andrea Wolff on the legacy of German philosopher Friedrich Schelling. It hints at our theme today, the forgotten art of natural philosophy. There are many ways to define natural philosophy, but basically it's the evaluation of the natural world, how it holds together, and what it all broadly means for us thinking creatures. It goes all the way back to Aristotle in the 4th century BC. Most things go back to Aristotle. Departing a little from his own teacher Plato, Aristotle thought that our senses, not just our minds, were pretty reliable. Sort of. As creatures in a creation, we are attuned to observing and reflecting on the natural world. That was his view. Before the term science was minted in the 19th century, many great thinkers in the fields of astronomy, physics, anatomy, medicine, and mathematics were known as natural philosophers, people who philosophized about nature. They studied both what we call science and the liberal arts, literature, logic, rhetoric, and so on. In fact, they combined these two systems into a coherent whole. Here's Friedrich Schelling. Unlike Isaac Newton, who had described matter as being essentially inert, or the French philosopher René Descartes, who had declared animals to be machines, Schelling's so-called nature philosophy, nature philosophy, questioned these mechanical models of nature. Instead, Schelling pronounced that everything from insects to trees, stones to birds, rivers to humans, was part of one great organism. Don't fret. We're not going to be endorsing the panentheism Schelling sometimes seems to have taught, namely that divinity is in all things. But he's a good example of a tradition of holding all knowledge, physical as well as philosophical, together in a coherent framework. In the 18th and 19th centuries, natural philosophy fragmented into the disciplines of modern science. Think chemistry, biology, physics, and the like. And the philosophers were left to play in the playground by themselves. This pivot to specialist disciplines, unencumbered by deep things like philosophy, did coincide with undeniable technological and medical progress, But it's debatable whether this intellectual fragmentation resulted in those breakthroughs. And it's probably undeniable that this splitting apart of natural study and philosophical study has led to a society that is big on progress, industry, health and entertainment. We're awesome at that. But is light on meaning the very thing that gives humans a sense of significance in this natural world. And that brings me to my guest today. Back by popular demand, few people have thought more or more deeply about both science and meaning than longtime Oxford professor Alistair McGrath. 
Alistair was on the show way back in season two, where he was talking about why science and religion are complementary. At the time, he was Andreas Idrius Professor of Science and Religion at Oxford. He's since retired, and I say retired in adverted commas because he's one of those lofty professors they still entrust with the keys to all the Oxford vaults, and who is still pumping out important works, like his latest one, Natural Philosophy, on retrieving a lost disciplinary imaginary, in which he makes the case for a bit more natural philosophy in the scientific world. It's a classic question we ask on this podcast. What could contemporary science learn from those old fuddy-duddy ways of thinking about reality? Quite a bit, as it turns out. I'm John Dixon, and this is Undeceptions. This season of Undeceptions is sponsored by Zondervan Academic. Get discounts on master lectures, video courses, and exclusive samples of their books at zondervanacademic.com forward slash Undeceptions. Don't forget to write Undeceptions. Each episode here at Undeceptions, we explore some aspect of life, faith, philosophy, history, science, culture, or ethics that's either much misunderstood or mostly forgotten. And with the help of people who know what they're talking about, we're trying to undeceive ourselves and let the truth out. As you well know, Alistair, there's a sign above one of the old school entrances uh, from the Bodleian Courtyard that reads, Scola Naturalis Philosophiae. What on earth did students do when they entered that door into the classroom? When they entered that door, they would have entered a, a realm of reflection on what nature is all about, how it works, and also what does it mean? And perhaps even more importantly, how do we live meaningfully in this world? What are our responsibilities towards nature? What can we learn from it? What can we learn about it? It's really this total way of engaging the natural world and becoming better people as a result. And this is the definition of natural philosophy. This is natural philosophy. If you read scientific textbooks that say, hey, science was once called natural philosophy. No, mm. natural philosophy is natural science, but it adds on taking nature seriously and learning from it, not just learning about it. So in effect, we are entering a, a lost world, but a world that you and I need to reclaim. Like most philosophical traditions, natural philosophy can trace its roots back to ancient Greece. Plato insisted on the importance of maths for living in the real world. By the way, yes, my dear American friends, it is maths, not math. Because the subject is mathematics, not mathematic. We don't shorten statistics to stat, but stats. In the same way, mathematics becomes maths. I know I won't convince anyone, but here I stand, I can do no other. Anyway, Plato wrote about maths. For the soldier must learn the art of number, or he will not know how to organise his army. And the philosopher also, because he has to rise out of the transient world and grasp reality, and therefore he must be able to calculate. That said, it was, as I mentioned earlier, Plato's student Aristotle who took natural philosophy to new levels. If Plato liked to live up in the clouds of pure ideas, Aristotle liked to carry out little expeditions between heaven and earth, between pure ideas and practical observation of nature. And this formed the basis of a classical education. It was medieval Christians like Alcuin of York in the 8th century who preserved and promoted this classical approach, insisting that students, whether boys or girls, rich or poor, learn the seven disciplines. The first three, or trivium, were grammar, logic, and rhetoric. 
That's all designed so you can think and communicate thoughts. The next four, or quadrivium, were more about interrogating reality, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. Together, these formed the so-called liberal arts, and this was the foundation of all education until about five minutes ago in historical perspective. Only after this foundational education in the seven liberal arts did a student then learn the law or theology or medicine or history or whatever. The key idea behind it all was that knowledge is integrated. It was a unified world, wasn't it? It was a, it was a time when people thought all knowledge was connected in some way unpack that sort of unity of knowledge that undergirds the natural philosophy approach. If we look at the heyday of natural philosophy, say the 17th century, what we're talking about is no divisions into disciplines, biology, physics, mathematics. The whole thing is seen as one big intellectual playground, all of which is interconnected. And therefore, if you look at perhaps the best ever work of natural philosophy, which is uh, Johann Kepler's work of 1619, which is the heavenly harmonies, I mean, basically, it, it, there's mathematics, there's music, there's what we now call physics, what we now call astronomy. It's all there together, but it's not broken up. It's a seamless, integrated way of thinking about the natural world. And, you know, we've lost that vision. I wonder if we can reclaim a bit of it. Kepler was a German astronomer, mathematician, and musicologist, 1571 to 1630. He described certain laws of planetary motion, like the one that says the planets move around the sun elliptically. That's a pretty important one. In 2009, NASA actually named a telescope after him. The famous Kepler telescope was stationed in space to observe planets outside our solar system. Kepler, who was a devout Christian, would have loved the thought of this thing looking further into God's design in the universe. The telescope was retired in 2018, on the 388th anniversary of Kepler's death, and now it's just floating through space somewhere. Anyway, at the core of Kepler's thinking was the idea of cosmic harmony. He wrote, the heavenly motions are nothing but a continuous song for several voices, perceived by the intellect, not by the ear. Physics, astronomy, and music, they were all related. How does natural philosophy differ from that other thing people think about as natural theology? They are different, but in what way? I think natural philosophy was a neutral word. It was simply, in effect, here is this world. Isn't it amazing? Let's try and make sense of it. Let's try and appreciate it. Let's try and live properly within it. Robert Boyle, for example, spoke of um, a priest in the temple of nature. You're trying to understand it, but you're trying to reverence it as well. Natural theology is a contested notion, but it would normally mean something like this. There's a pathway between the natural world and God. Now, interestingly, Natural philosophy includes that. In effect, it would be very much, you know, and not simply what is nature saying us about, telling us about itself, about our place in nature, but also in what way does nature enable us to appreciate God. But natural theology, as that term is now used, would mean something like an apologetic undertaking which aims to demonstrate either the rationality of the Christian faith or the existence of God on the basis of either pure natural reason or intelligent reflection on the natural world. And you get that idea in natural philosophy, but it's part of a bigger picture. Yes. Tell me about the origins of natural philosophy. I mean, you, you took us to the 17th century, but in a sense, we can say Aristotle was doing natural philosophy. Can you unpack the origins, but particularly Aristotle's approach? Yes, so we're stepping back 2,000 years from the 17th century. And Aristotle was remarkable. Aristotle himself wasn't really a scientist, but he lived on the island of Lesbos and was enchanted by a natural world. And, and local fishermen would bring him reports of what fish did. And Aristotle began to think, well, maybe, maybe there's some patterns here. Maybe we can try and explain these complex patterns by 
positing some general principles. And so we find Aristotle beginning to develop the ideas that there's the world of appearances and behind it, there is a kind of patterning or a kind of set of first principles. And once you've got those sorted out, then you know, you're really in business. In every inquiry, the examination of material elements and instruments is not to be regarded as final, but as ancillary to the conception of the total form. Thus, the true object of architecture is not bricks, mortar or timber, but the house, and so the principal object of natural philosophy is not the material elements, but their composition and the totality of the form to which they are subservient and independently of which they have no existence. Aristotle on parts of animals. So in effect, we have here the beginnings of what we now call natural philosophy or even natural science. What I think Aristotle is really good about is trying to say, whatever you think, you have to be governed by the by your observations. It's about the phenomena have to be preserved. Whatever your theory is, it has to be able to accommodate what you observe. So in other words, facts are sacred, interpretations can vary, but you've got to make sure that those observations find their way into Did he differ theories. a little from his master, Plato, on, on, that, on that score in emphasizing natural phenomena? I think he did. I think that if you take Plato, I mean, Plato and Aristotle both have a, a great interest in the Greek word theoria. We, you know, we now say theory, it means a way of beholding things. And for Aristotle, this explicitly includes the natural world. For Plato, it's a bit like a sort of intellectual world, which curiously doesn't really engage nature at all. Plato doesn't really seem to think that reflecting on the natural world is important. It's, if anything, Plato is saying, look inside yourself, you know, whereas Aristotle is saying, well, you can do it if you want to, but really look at that world and learn from it. Aristotle's natural philosophy was summed up in what he called physics and metaphysics. He wrote works by those titles. The study of the physical world and the contemplation of what it all means. This formed the basis for elite Greek and Roman education before it was, we might say, democratised a little in medieval Europe, as I mentioned earlier. What about the so-called medieval period. How early in that uh, post-classical world do we find people doing what we can recognise as natural philosophy? Well, we can see what we would recognise now as natural philosophy in, for example, the, the, work, the work of the Venerable Bede in Northumbria. You know, basically, he's trying to reflect on nature and make sense of it. There are tensions between the fact Woohoo! Bede! Go check out episode 94 for everything Venerable Bede. More in the show notes. But I think it really natural philosophy begins to flourish again in what we call the Middle Ages, particularly in the 13th century. And a very important development here is at the University of Paris, where there are tensions between the Faculty of Arts and the Faculty of Philosophy. And in effect, a sort of consensus emerges that there's this thing called theology, which relies on revelation and scripture, and there's this thing called natural philosophy, which actually allows human reason unaided to just kind of way roam over the natural world and make sense of what it sees. So if you like, there was almost like a gentleman's agreement that these two were different, but actually they could talk to each other in some meaningful ways. Have you got some good examples of natural philosophers in this Middle Ages period? Well, Albert the Great stands out for a number of reasons. Albert the Great was a German friar and university professor in the 13th century. And a shout out here to all our German listeners. Your country has loads of great natural philosophers and historians and theologians and musicians and scientists. As well as being a philosopher and scientist, Albert the Great was also a bishop. People called him Dr. Universalis, teacher of everything. And researcher Al and producer Kaylee reckon they want to make an Albert t-shirt out of that. Anyway, Albert read and commented on pretty much all of Aristotle, and he passed that knowledge 
onto a young, shy student who eventually eclipsed him, Thomas Aquinas. Thomas was nicknamed Dr. Angelicus, basically the teacher who was out of this world. But back to Albert, who reckoned natural philosophy was not just the domain of pious Christians with theological interests, it was actually for every thinking person. He loved Aristotle and, and thought he could use him theologically as well as in terms of natural philosophy. But uh, Albert the Great basically emphasized that in engaging the natural world, you do not have to make use of theological techniques which in effect depend on divine revelation. He was saying you, you can look at the world through a kind of theological lens and that's great, but you don't need to. You can simply engage nature on its own terms and that's what natural philosophy is. And you think it reaches its peak in the 17th century. So you've mentioned Kepler. Are others that you think are, are doing good natural philosophy? Isaac Newton. I mean, the, Isaac Newton's De Principis, the, the Principles of Natural Philosophy, is probably the best known and the most influential work of natural philosophy. Newton's 1687 work, Philosophia Naturalis Principia Mathematica, the Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, or Principia for short, is regarded by many today as the most influential scientific book ever. See the show notes for the references. Like Friedrich Schelling mentioned at the top of the show, Newton saw all physical reality, especially gravity, his big topic, as imbued with divine power. And interestingly, for reasons we don't quite understand, so much happens in England, particularly here in Oxford and also to some extent in Cambridge. So it really is beginning to emerge as a very significant way of thinking. So I would say the 17th century really, if you like, is the golden age of natural philosophy. Is it an accident that it comes to this golden age in a thoroughly Christian worldview? I think that, if I can put it like this, the Christian worldview gives you a very good lens to look at the natural world through. I mean, a number of points. Number one, it gives you a religious motivation. God made this world. Therefore, whatever God made is good. We therefore need to look at it and value it and appreciate it and also try to understand it. Because in some way, the greater glory, the greater wisdom of God is manifest in the wisdom and the glory of this created order. That's a very important thing. You find that in Calvin. But it's a commonplace, actually, within natural philosophy. But the second point, which is really interesting, is this sense of a coherent universe. You might think of, of Colossians 1.17, all things cohere or hang together in Christ, that's there in natural philosophy. There's some hidden coherence that we can find by intelligent reflection. So if you like, it's saying we inhabit a coherent world and hence we can live meaningfully within this world. But another point about the 17th century is that during the 17th century, England had its first and only war of religion. You know, Charles versus Parliament, the, the Civil War. Once that was over, once the monarchy was restored, there were still these massive tensions in England between Puritans, Anglicans, Catholics, all these things unresolved. And natural philosophy came to be seen as a way that every religious person could kind of have a seat at the table. And in effect, it was seen as a way of achieving some some way of, of reintegrating um, British intellectual culture when it had fallen to bits over other issues. So it's not just a unitary form of knowledge, it, it was sociologically unifying, do you think? Well, exactly. Uh, and the Royal Society of London, which was founded by Charles II, really, it had two agendas. One was to promote what we now call natural science. But the second agenda was to kind of bring people back together again, so that, in effect, England's intellectual life could be rekindled and reignited. So there's that very important cultural theme going on. The Royal Society is still a big deal today. It's the oldest independent scientific academy in the world, founded in 1660. Their motto was and is nullius in verba, on no one's word. Basically, empirical facts, not authority. Now that sounds like a rejection of religion. That's how we today use facts, not authority. 
But that's not really what it meant at the time. Founding members of the society were people like the chemist Robert Boyle, who was devoutly interested in finding God's wisdom in fundamental physical realities, or the mathematician John Wallace, who was an active clergyman. That's not to say, though, that this natural philosophy movement was all religious. It was, as Alistair tells me, ecumenical. Were there people who were avowedly not Christian, but still happily did natural philosophy and would have called it natural philosophy? I think natural philosophy was seen as ecumenical, if I can use that word. I mean, they didn't use that word, but if you look at medieval culture, you'll see there's a, there are several types of Christian natural philosophy. There's an Islamic natural philosophy, particularly in Spain. There's a Jewish natural philosophy. And it's all they're all doing the same thing, but interestingly, bringing their own specific theological commitments to this and finding they could work with it. So if you like, natural philosophy is a broad church, and certainly those who were agnostic or atheist, although actually people kept quite quiet about that in the 17th century, would have had a seat at the table without any particular difficulty. Yeah, so because they felt there was no real intellectual break between studying the natural world and studying ethics, studying aesthetics, and, and so on. They held them together even if they didn't believe in God. Well, I think that's basically it. That Christian natural philosophers would say, look, <laughs> believing in God brings an awful lot of added value. <laughs> you know, it actually roots the whole thing. It gives, it gives it a firm grounding and actually allows you to, to transfer your sense of wonder at the beauty of nature to worship God. Mm -hmm. um, not everyone wanted to go that way, but actually people could see that you could go that way. So there's a sort of willingness to suspend difference on that point. The Middle Ages saw some amazing contributions from natural philosophers beyond the European Christian context. In 9th century Baghdad, the House of Wisdom was a community of Christian scholars working side by side with their Islamic buddies. It would make an amazing episode, actually. Can you mark that down, producer Kaylee? Basically, Byzantine Christian scholars in the 7th to the 9th centuries gave the Islamic world all the classical Greek traditions of mathematics, astronomy, medicine, and philosophy, especially Aristotle. And then these Islamic scholars made huge advances in all of these areas before taking that knowledge, including the knowledge of Aristotle, back into the far west in Spain. And from there, Almost doing a geographical and intellectual circle, this knowledge came back into Western Europe from Spain just before the time of Albert the Great in 1200. That would be a cool episode. Then there's the amazing Jewish natural philosopher, Moses Maimonides, also called Rambam. True story. He was born in Spain around 1100, but did much of his best work among Muslims in Egypt. He wrote on the Jewish law and the Bible more generally, but also on astronomy and philosophy. His book, Guide for the Perplexed, what a great title, was an attempt to reconcile Hebrew Jewish traditions with Greek philosophy and rational observation. We could go on with historical examples like this, but there's another question to ask. Why did all this cross-disciplinary, cross-cultural, interfaith, natural philosophy lose steam? How did cold, hard science become the great party pooper at the natural philosophy shindig? All of that after the break. This episode of Underceptions is brought to you by Zondervan Academic's new book, Jesus and the Powers, by N.T. Wright and Underceptions favourite, Mike Bird. Should Christianity have anything to do with politics? I mean, you could argue that Christians have done more harm than good once they get a whiff of power. Mike Bird and N.T. Wright address this question and other questions in this magnificent overview of the political implications of the Christian faith and the church's historical engagement with the powers and principalities. They shed light on current geopolitical events and ask, what would it look like if there were 
a faithful Christian response to crises like the Russia-Ukraine conflict, the China-Taiwan tension, political turmoil in the US, UK and Australia, and the problem of Christian nationalism. They build a pretty convincing case that Jesus' teaching about the kingdom of God confronts all forms of power, Christian and atheist, and calls on us all to support a pluralistic democracy where everyone, regardless of religion or irreligion, has a role to play in working toward the good of society. Whether you're a believer or a skeptic, I'd say this book will be an eye-opener. You can order Jesus and the Powers on Amazon, of course, or head to zondervanacademic.com forward slash undeceptions to dig a little deeper and see if you really like it. That's zondervanacademic.com forward slash undeceptions. Let's break it down. Hydrogen. What does that give us? By mole, uh-huh. we're looking at 63%. 63? Mm-hmm. Wow. That is a big bite. And next step has got to be oxygen. Oxygen, 26%. 26. There you have your water. Mm-hmm. Carbon, 9%. Carbon, 9 Or a total of 98%. Right. Nitrogen, 1.25%. 1.25. That brings you to 99 and a quarter, which only leaves you with the trace elements down where the magic happens. Just seems like something's missing, doesn't it? There's got to be more to a human being than that. What about the soul? There's nothing but chemistry here. That's a scene from the first season of the legendary TV drama Breaking Bad. It's a haunting flashback in which Walter White is breaking down the components of the human body with his friend and colleague Gretchen Schwartz. The scene cuts between the memory and present day Walter disposing of the body of a man he's just killed. Lovely stuff. I thought Breaking Bad was brilliant. And I hated it. In fact, Buff and I only watched Breaking Bad up to this gruesome episode, and then we just pressed stop and we were out of there. Anyway, Walter is all science. Gretchen is more philosophical, open to the idea of a soul. Walter's playful dig, there's only chemistry here, could function as a motto for some approaches to the natural world today. It's only stuff, and the stuff points to nothing beyond itself. When was the parting of the ways? When did natural philosophy get booted out and hard natural science come to be the term that we use now? I would see this happening during the 19th century. I think it happens for a number of reasons. I think one of them is that natural philosophy begins to lose its intellectual traction. You know, people begin to feel that it doesn't really engage the new questions of the the emerging culture of the Industrial Revolution. So that's an issue, but, but because if you think about it, the Eng- England's Industrial Revolution, let's say it begins in the 1790s, okay? But basically, this is now about exploiting nature for commercial purposes. And that doesn't fit well with natural philosophy, which is very much about respecting nature. So the tension begins to emerge. But really, what happens in the 19th century are writers like um, Thomas Huxley is a very good example, who will say that, in effect, we don't need natural philosophy. We just have natural science. Science, in effect, is the new category we're going to use. And we're getting rid of the philosophy thing altogether. Science is what matters. Thomas Huxley was known as Darwin's bulldog, thanks to his staunch defence of Charles Darwin's ideas on evolution. He didn't have much time for natural philosophy. When simple curiosity passes into the love of knowledge as such, 
and the gratification of the aesthetic sense of the beauty of completeness and accuracy seems more desirable than the easy indolence of ignorance when the finding out of the causes of things becomes a source of joy and he is accounted happy who is successful in the search, common knowledge passes into what our forefathers called natural history, whence there is but a step to that which used to be termed natural philosophy and now passes by the name of physical science. In this final state of knowledge, the phenomena of nature are regarded as one continuous series of causes and effects, and the ultimate object of science is to trace out that series, from the term which is nearest to us, to that which is at the farthest limit accessible to our means of investigation. The word scientist minted it's minted, actually, by William Huell, a well-known Cambridge philosopher. And he thought, look, if you do art, you're an artist. So if you do science, you're a scientist. And this is about the investigation of the natural order. It's very analytical, and there isn't really any sense of appreciating or comprehending or valuing nature or seeing it as a signpost to something greater. It's understanding it in its own terms, and that's the end of it. We now have a word for someone who can combine all kinds of knowledge, scientific, historical, theological, artistic, and so on. We say they are a Renaissance man or a Renaissance woman. That's because during the Renaissance of the 14th century, people were still interested in all the disciplines and how they related to each other. But Alistair tells me, as a practical matter, this just became too difficult as time went on. To what degree did the acceleration of knowledge contribute to this parting of the ways? Um, I, I'm assuming, uh, you know, at the beginning of the 17th century, you could know mm, most things about what we know of the natural world. You, you could have read most philosophy, you could have read most theology, but with the explosion of knowledge that comes, people just sort of gave up trying to know philosophy and theology as well as the information given to us by natural science. This is really a very important point. Um, there are some scholars who say that the phrase, the Renaissance man, began to be used extensively in the 19th century because people felt we've lost this. The Renaissance man is an idealized scholar of the 16th century who in effect knew philosophy, knew physics, knew biology, not by those names, but basically would see all of this as something that you could manage and hold together. And then gradually it became a little bit more dispersed. You, um, the idea of the Renaissance uh, became having a group of people who might be able to come together and bring these things together, but it was getting too much for one individual to manage. So if you like, we have the fragmentation of knowledge, N not because knowledge itself can be fragmented easily, but because a single individual can't take it in. And we have this fascinating phenomenon of what is in effect information overload. A single individual no longer can cope with a huge body of literature, and so you find disciplines emerging and then subdividing. And the result is that today you have such specialization, such a specialist body of literature, that in effect one scientist may not even understand what another scientist is doing, let alone be able to converse with them. You have the fragmentation of science. And that's what happens really in the 19th century. People are saying this, this is happening. And in fact, in English, we do use the word science, but that was a deliberate political choice in the 1830s, because people were worried that if we spoke of individual sciences, that might seem to lead to the fragmentation of a community of knowledge. And therefore you said, it's science, it's a scientist, and that means in fact you're all part of the single big community. But I have to say that that really is now a hopeless idealization because of the, the massive expansion of scientific disciplines and the fragmentation of disciplinary knowledge. After the Renaissance came the scientific revolution. It's where the action was in the 17th and 18th centuries. That's when we get the disparate disciplines of biology, chemistry, physics, and so on. Pretty soon, a physicist couldn't hope to know much about what the biologist down the road was up to, let alone what the great philosophers were discussing. Knowledge became intensely specialised and separate, and so was lost the very notion of integrating what we discover about reality. 
let alone talking about the meaning of everything. So let's talk about what's lost because of this parting of the ways. What is lost for our world, for the scientist, by this turning our back on natural philosophy? Well, I think the first thing we lose is any sense that nature is special. If you look at someone like Steven Weinberg's recent attempt to um, give a history of natural sciences, it's very much a functional approach to nature. And, and Weinberg's very clear, we have to leave behind these outdated ideas of science as engaging with meaning or value. It's simply trying to work out how things function. And to me, we have lost something there in a big way. I think I understand how human bodies work, but I think there's more to human beings than just our biological functionality. You know, it's that kind of thing. So we have lost a bigger picture. I think science nowadays is seen rather as a technocratic discipline, where in effect you have people who research, who crunch numbers. But if you want to know the meaning of life or what is, what is good, you're not going to ask them. What do they know about it? So in effect, we have, if you like, a disengagement of what would once have been seen as one of the most important areas of reflection on this topic with the big questions of meaning and value. So we've lost something very, very big there, I think. Despite this fragmentation of the sciences, several notable modern thinkers have tried to keep the flame of natural philosophy alive. One is the late Austro-British academic Sir Karl Popper. He's best known for developing the idea of falsification. A good scientific hypothesis is credible only if it has the ability to be disproven. Less well known is Popper's idea of three worlds. Popper is really very interesting. As a philosopher of science, he was really very engaged with trying to work out what distinguishes science from pseudosciences like Marxism or indeed Freudianism. And I think, I think he, he did a lot of very good things there. One thing he did was to introduce his idea of the three worlds. Now, when I say three worlds, I do not mean three individuate and disconnected worlds. It's more three broad areas of thought which actually are interconnected. There's the idea of theory, the world of theory. There's a world of objectivity and there's a world of subjectivity. In other words, we're dealing with the external world. We're dealing with the way we feel about things. And we're also dealing with these intellectual constructs we develop called theories. And what Popper realized was that actually, while your emphasis might vary, you could find a way of holding all of these together. A good theory enabled you to maintain the objectivity of nature while at the same time integrating your subjective responses to nature, like awe, beauty, wonder. In other words, he gave us a framework for recovering what had been lost. So I think Popper is very, very interesting, but unfortunately, he's not widely cited in this context. Yes, and in fact, he's often associated with just the objectivity part, that he was really just encouraging us to think about what can be objectively nailed down, and that the other two dimensions didn't seem to be as important to those who you know, post-Popper. Well, I think that's right. I mean, and Popper was a very rich thinker, uh, and it's understandable people would focus on those aspects of his thinking that they particularly liked or appreciated, but he does go broader than that. And I find him very helpful because he gave me this framework for saying, look, although these things have drifted apart, there is a framework which allows us to bring them back together again. And I mean, what I would want to say actually is, although Popper is a secular writer, I can easily see as a Christian how I could say, if I say, look, I've got Christian theology as my base, you know, my, this vision of reality, that in effect does for me what Popper's idea of the world of theory does, which is to give me this coherent intellectual framework that brings these things together. So for me, Christianity gives us this. My concern was trying to say, well, supposing I'm talking to people who don't share my Christian presuppositions, how can I begin to show them how they can bring these things back together again? I think Popper really is very helpful there. Next up on Professor McGrath's list of modern natural philosophers comes arguably the biggest brain of the 20th century, Albert Einstein. What about Einstein? Um, you mention in your book that he comes close to being described as a natural philosopher. I have to admit, I, I love Einstein. I first encountered Einstein here at Oxford. 
1971 when I began to study chemistry here. We had a wonderful option on quantum theory. And Einstein, of course, was a very big name. We studied him in detail. I found him wonderful. What I found particularly engaging was the way in which he said, look, science, religion, ethics and politics are all different, but they're all very important, then you can hold them all together. Because they are different, they are not incompatible for that reason. That's a very important point. But Einstein, I think, really is a natural philosopher, as Newton was, you know, because in effect he's saying, I want a big picture of the natural world, and it is going to include religion, it's going to include well, obviously, mathematics is going to include, well, actually, ethics too. You know, and he's saying we, we want to try and find this. And as you'll know, Einstein had this relentless quest for unification. So many people today, and even professional scientists, seem to me like somebody who has seen thousands of trees, but has never seen a forest. A knowledge of the historic and philosophical background gives that kind of independence from prejudices of his generation, from which most scientists are suffering. This independence, created by philosophical insight, is, in my opinion, the mark of distinction between a mere artisan or specialist and a real seeker after truth. I think I, I can follow him through and say, look, we all need a big picture of reality to hold things together. Popper gives us one, though people tend to only focus on one bit of it. But Christianity really is good at doing this for us. It gives us this wonderful lens, or if you want to you know, think of C.S. Lewis's image of a sun rising on a landscape, you suddenly see how everything's there and is interconnected. So it's very important. Einstein really helped me just to see how, A, important a big picture is. And then beginning to realize as I discovered Christianity, that actually Christianity did something similar, but in my view, even better. As a treat for our Plus subscribers, I asked Alistair about Einstein's approach to faith. Was he really the archetypal atheist that some would have us believe? If you're interested in the answer, consider becoming a Plus subscriber. Sorry about that. Undeceptions.com forward slash plus. All the goodies are there. We are in the position of a little child entering a huge library filled with books in many languages. The child knows someone must have written these books. It does not know who or how. It does not understand the languages in which they are written. The child dimly suspects a mysterious order in the arrangement of the books, but doesn't know what it is. That, it seems to me, is the attitude of even the most intelligent human being toward God. Einstein, in the Saturday Evening Post, October 26, 1929. Einstein certainly wasn't an atheist. He openly pondered a mind behind the universe. But a rising intellectual mood of atheism probably did play a role in booting the natural philosophy tradition out of field. That's after the break. And we have to become humble in front of this overwhelming misery and overwhelming fornication, overwhelming growth, and overwhelming lack of order. Even the, the stars up here in the, in the sky look like a mess. There is no harmony in the universe. We have to get acquainted to this idea that there is no real harmony as we have conceived it. That's legendary film director Werner Herzog giving a rather grim piece to camera in the middle of the Peruvian jungle. Herzog was filming a documentary called Burden of Dreams about the arduous making of his 1982 feature film Fitzcarraldo. Some say the documentary about the making of the film is better than the film it was documenting. Funnily enough as well, just quickly, that, so that Herzog thing is sampled in one of my favourite death metal bands. I was going to ask you where you came up with that because then, like, it was... Yeah, I thought, well, that was bizarre. Yeah, and I've, I've messaged them to let them know that we're using it and they got back to me and then so we got a death metal band pretty keen to hear this episode, <laughs> which is great. Can you ask if we can use the song? Sure, I'll, se I'll send you the tune and see what you think of it. It's pretty hectic. We have to get acquainted to this idea that... There is no harmony in the universe. 
Sure enough, Researcher Al came through. That's Sydney Death Metal Act Low, one of Researcher Al's favourite bands. And everyone should rush out and listen to them. Go search on Spotify Low and look for the song The Gleaners. Thanks so much, guys, for letting us play this. But anyway, Herzog's observations about the destruction, violence and chaos of the jungle illustrate where Alistair fears science without a little natural philosophy might lead us, a blindness to the harmony of the universe. Many other thinkers have echoed Herzog's pessimism in recent years. Physicist Brian Greene's book, Until the End of Time, grapples with the concept of a meaningless universe and ties the fate of humans to the demise of the solar system itself. Meanwhile, philosopher David Benatar sensationally argued that even being born is bad due to the chaos of existence. His book is titled Better Never to Have Been, The Harm of Coming into Existence. Amazing stuff. He must have been awesome at dinner parties. Is this where the world of science and humanities leads us without the influence of natural philosophy. Could a dedicated atheist, or even one of these new anti-theists, be a good natural philosopher? Well, I imagine that they would say that they could. I I would suggest what they're they're doing really is saying, I can understand nature as a self-contained closed system and make some sense of it and maybe even appreciate its beauty. I think that the older forms of natural philosophy were porous to the idea of transcendence. In other words, we are looking at nature, isn't it wonderful? But nature is almost like a system of signs pointing beyond itself. And therefore, natural philosophy is inevitably going to end up heading in the direction of theology or philosophy or or even music, you know, the idea of harmony. There's something deep there that goes way beyond our objective analysis of nature. So I think that the term natural philosophy might mean different things to different people. For me, it includes this willingness, this receptivity towards going further and saying nature is not a closed system. In effect, it is porous to the transcendent and the appreciation of the beauty of this world, in effect, opens up possibilities for thinking about something beyond this world. Without requiring a particular doctrine once you get to that field. Absolutely. Let, let's take an example. Let's take Roger Penrose, who I, you know, he won the Nobel Prize recently. He's an Oxford man, so you know, local hero. Um, <laughs> Sir Roger Penrose is a mathematician, physicist, and philosopher of science. He's a Nobel laureate in physics. Alistair has some very cool nerdy friends. He got the 2020 Nobel Prize for his work on black holes, of all things. He's not religious, but he's got this natural philosophy vibe about him. Consider this statement he made. I think I would say that the universe has a purpose. It's not somehow just there by chance. Some people, I think, take the view that the universe is just there and it runs along. It's a bit like it just sort of computes and we happen somehow by accident to find ourselves in this thing. But I don't think that's a very fruitful or helpful way of looking at the universe. I think that there is something much deeper about it. And he and I have talked about this. I mean, he is not a religious man. He would not describe himself as religious. But as you will know, he in effect says, to make sense of this world, we have to propose a almost a platonic mathematical world, which really exists independently of us. We discover it. We don't invent it. And when you discover that, it makes sense of what we see around us. So you can see where he's going. And in effect, you know, as a Christian... It's clearly metaphysics, if not theology. He's going into metaphysics. He he doesn't want to go to theology, but he's clearly going into to a transcendent way of thinking. Uh, I would say to him simply, look, um, I'm with you on this, but I can can rename this and I can do even more with it than you can. What are some modern crises that you think the natural philosophy approach to knowledge can help with? 
Well, let me mention some. I mean, I, I think we, we really do need to rediscover this. One is the way in which, in effect, we have allowed the investigation of nature to become detached from the appreciation of nature and a desire to preserve nature. And that's a real problem. I mean, here in Oxford, you, know, you, you, have, you have concerted efforts in the 17th century to have a sort of physic garden, you know, a, a way of preserving the best of, of the natural world. And I think the difficulty is that we are now seeing sort of the emergence of an ethic which is saying, if we can do it, we will do it. If it enables us to live longer, we will do it. In other words, the sense is the world is there for our exploitation and our convenience. The original natural philosophy saw, in effect, that the world as being something wonderful, which we had the privilege of investigating, the privilege of inhabiting, and studying the world enabled us to live better lives in this world. We've lost that altogether. A second thing we have lost, and again, in principle, I think we can recover at least something of this, is the sense that nature, in effect, is, it is wonderful, but part of its wonder is its capacity to point beyond itself. You know, in effect, one of the th most amazing things that happened during the 17th century was what's called the mathematization of nature, the realization that to understand nature, you, you could, in fact, bring in these mathematical frameworks, which were wonderful, and they fitted. In other words, that nature was pointing to something even more beautiful, which helped you to make sense of it. And I think that the recovery of a sense of the transcendent dimensions of nature really is very, very important. This exact point was made beautifully on an earlier episode of Underceptions, Beautiful Science, with Professors Ard Louis and Andrew Briggs of Oxford. Here's a little clip from my chat with Ard about how mysteriously structured nature appears to be. So if you look outside in my garden, you'll see various trees. And uh, I have a walnut tree and a birch tree, and they have very different shapes. Now, interestingly, that walnut tree's shape is not encoded in like a blueprint in its DNA. There's not like a little shape of the tree, put a leaf here, put a branch there. Instead, the tree has an algorithm that basically makes leaves a certain probability, branches a certain probability. And if you run that algorithm, then you get a, that shape comes out. The birch tree has a slightly different algorithm, which gives it a kind of more, more flowing birch shape. And so there's no, there's no blueprint in the DNA. It's actually an algorithm. An algorithm is a fancy word for like a computational program that's being run. And so now imagine that there is a mutation to that algorithm, okay? You might, it might be that actually a small mutation in the algorithm changes you from walnut shape to birch shape really quickly. Or it may be that it's really hard to go from walnut shape to birch shape. And so to understand that, you shouldn't look at the shape of the trees, but rather try to understand the algorithms. Like a simple change in the algorithm is, is, for example, now double this process, make something twice as big, right? That's one little line change and a huge outcome happens. If I randomly change that program, I might see very big changes happening in certain directions and very small changes happening in other directions. So what I'm saying is the mutations are random, but the outcomes are highly non-random. And the question then is, if that's true, what direction are they non-random? That's the question I'm thinking about. So our idea, that we've been developing over the last few years is that if you think about these algorithms, if you think about mutations at the genes really effectively being mutations of the algorithms, then what's going to happen is if you need to evolve some kind of new phenotype, let's say the, the walnut tree needs to change into a more birch-like shape because the weather changes, the climate changes, then what is going to happen is it's going to randomly tweak that algorithm. And the first algorithm that it finds that does the job roughly okay is the one it's going to pick. Now, let's think about symmetry. So on my, right here in my kitchen, you, you can see in the tiles on my floor and they're regularly placed. So if I say to you, come please tile my kitchen, um, it's much easier for you to say, take this pattern and repeat it n times. That's a short description. I could also tile my kitchen with every tile in a slightly different place. Okay, I'd have to like tell, give you a, a blueprint of every tile. That's a lot of information I need to give you. Now imagine that I am just randomly making tile assembly programs to assemble the tiles in my kitchen, I'm much more likely to find a simple program, because it's just a few lines to describe, than a long, complicated program. So that's the argument. If I randomly search in the space of tiling algorithms, so tell me, tell me how to tile your floor, I'm much more likely to find a symmetric way of doing it than a non-symmetric one. So we've looked, for example, at lots of properties of nature and seen those huge amount of symmetry there. 
And the question is, why is that symmetry there? We're saying, well, it's just there because it's easy to find. I love that guy. He is my favourite duchy. Apart from my good friends, the Backer family. Hi, Backers. Link in the show notes for the entire thing. There's one more crisis Alistair reckons natural philosophy can help with. If I were to mention one more thing, which I think is very, very important, it is this need to try and bridge the gaps between professional disciplines. Because what I'm finding in my own personal conversations here at Oxford is that people are wonderfully informed about their own disciplines, but don't really get others and don't know how to talk and can't make connections. And I think that if I could use the word interdisciplinarity, it means in effect not simply knowing your own discipline, but being willing to step into other people's and saying, that's really interesting. I can see how I connect up with what I'm doing, but the knowledge investment levels are so high that very few people are able to do it. What about um, psychologically, existentially? Do Do you think there would be benefits to the community if we took a more natural philosophy approach? I think that's a very good question. I think the answer is yes. I mean, the positive psychologists say that really meaning is the jackpot of happiness, human happiness. Martin Seligman, Dan Gilbert, they're, they're all atheists, but they nonetheless say that when a human thinks they're plugged into something higher, they can enjoy life even if they don't have much pleasure. Well, I think that's a very important point. I mean, going back to Aristotle, he used this idea of eudaimonia, which is sometimes known as happiness. It's, it's not that. It's, it's almost flourishing. It's, it's, yeah. it, it, and positive psychology has really helped us to recover this. If you look at other psychologists like Crystal Park, a very good example, she will say that meaning is a really significant category. But it's very, very hard to define. What we know is if you have this, you flourish. If you don't have this, you wither. You know, and so it's really important. And, and the minute you're talking about meaning, you're going beyond the empirical. You're going be, you're, it's an interpretation of the world, not an observation. You can observe that having this framework makes people flourish. But observation doesn't take you to the framework. It's something you have to construct on the basis of a belief system. And so very often you'll find that psychologists will say the key elements are, number one, a sense of purpose. Number two, a sense of some bigger picture of what you are part. Uh, and, and you can add to this this. But basically, it is so important. I think that's where psychology really has brought home to us that a purely empirical reading of nature is not enough. You want to have a bigger picture of reality and say, here is where I fit into this. And of course, Christianity does that extraordinarily well. But natural philosophy, I think, does take you quite a long step in that right direction. By in effect saying, position yourself within this bigger picture of reality and realize you have responsibilities, you have privileges, and you can exult in the beauty of this world. So there's, there's a good way ahead there. It might not be possible or practical to expect Renaissance men and Renaissance women to reemerge today. But maybe, just maybe, we can be Renaissance kids starting to take baby steps toward the integration of knowledge? Alistair has four tips, really four lenses through which we can begin to view reality more holistically. You talk about four lenses the natural philosopher puts on mm. when viewing reality, the scientific, aesthetic, ethical, and spiritual. Can you talk us through each one? Well, it's really a way of trying to say, although each of us is a single individual, we can nevertheless bring together multiple perspectives, multiple ways of looking at things inside our heads. And so, for example, a scientific approach, that's all about how things function. I've just seen a leaf fall on a tree. And so I can I actually give you quite a good account scientifically of how that happened. And that, that's very helpful. And also, of course, as a scientist, you begin to appreciate the beauty of the mathematical representations you have of the natural world. But also, you begin to realize that you are wrestling with the idea of the beauty of nature, an aesthetic quality. That's not objective. That's the way I feel, the way I respond to it. It might be grounded in something more complex, Maybe beauty is a placeholder for simplicity, I don't know. But nevertheless, it's, it's an integral part of who we are as people. We respond to beauty. And early natural philosophers saw beauty as a criterion to use. For example, even in today's philosophy of science, beauty is a criterion for theory choice. The more beautiful the theory is, the more likely it is to be right. 
This is a fascinating rabbit hole. A 1998 article in American Scientist posed the question, is beauty a sign of scientific truth? The article quotes Sir Roger Penrose mentioned earlier. It is a mysterious thing, in fact, how something which looks attractive may have a better chance of being true than something which looks ugly. So often, in fact, it turns out that the more attractive possibility is the true one. The article goes on to note that the famed mathematician Paul Dirac was convinced of Einstein's theory of relativity on aesthetic grounds, because it was beautiful. Now, it's debated what even beauty is, so check out episode 70, The Artist, for more on that topic. Was that the ep I almost cried in, producer Kaylee, or was it the music one? I can't remember. The music one. It was the music one. Do you reckon it is, Mark? Which one did he cry in? I actually thought it was the um, artist one. Yeah, I might. Yeah, I'm, I think maybe I've got it wrong. That's the one. I'm feeling a bit teary now. Then, of course, we move on to the ethical side of things, which is, in effect, asking how on earth do we live properly? Maybe we can learn from what we see around us. And that's something that's been airbrushed out of modern discussions. I think we need to bring that back in. And that means, is there a transcendent ground for ethics? Maybe there is. As a Christian, I would say God is a very important transcendent ground. But actually, maybe the natural world might come into this picture somewhere. And then finally, the spiritual side of things. I'm using the word spiritual because I want to include as many people as possible in this. Spiritual really is this deep, intuitive sense we're part of something bigger, we're connected. There's something, there's something there that is so much bigger than us that transcends us. And, and in a sense, trying to get in touch with it is really important. I think that a lot of people feel that way, which is why I think you know, Christianity does give us a very good way of looking at this by saying, in effect, it's not an abstract entity, it's a named reality with a face that we can see and know. So we can go in those directions as well. But I think the key point is, if you like, we can look at the same thing and we can look at it from different perspectives or different levels. Everything is there. The question is tuning into what's already there and appreciating those multiple aspects. Alistair reckons it's crucial to hold all these elements together, the ethical, philosophical, and so on. But some might fear that this will get in the way of the facts-only approach that science has become famous for. So I put that to Alistair as my closing question. Finally, Alistair, what would you say to the more sceptical listener who worries that all this lovely-sounding integration of knowledge under the rubric natural philosophy will spoil real science because it'll always be trying to um, do the mumbo jumbo spiritual ethical stuff alongside the the unbiased pursuit of truth about the natural world i fully understand that problem here's what i would say natural philosophy really is permissive it's saying look you, you can do all these things. You don't have to. And what I'd want to say to the kind of scientist you just described is, I appreciate exactly what you're saying. That's the bedrock of natural science. And I don't want in any way people to stop doing that. It's really, really important. I'm just saying you can add things onto that. You can kind of have connections. You can have conversations. You can perhaps see there's a bigger picture there which doesn't in any way detract from or distract from what you're doing. It's simply saying maybe there is more, but it doesn't stop you doing what you're doing and saying it's really important. It's just saying maybe there is a bigger picture here and maybe that actually might be something worth discovering. If you have questions about this episode or any of our other episodes, just ask. You'll see the options in the show notes at undeceptions.com to send us an audio or text message. I'll be answering a bunch of them in this season's Q&A episode. And if you want to support us, click the large donate button on our main page, undeceptions.com. For our US listeners who'd like to give a tax deductible donation, there's a link there specially for you. 
We really appreciate it. See ya. Underceptions is hosted by me, John Dixon, produced by Kaylee Payne and directed by Mark Bulldog Hadley. Sophie Hawkshaw is on socials and membership. Alistair Belling is writer and researcher. Siobhan McGuinness is our online librarian. Lindy Leveston remains my wonderful assistant. Santino DeMarco is chief finance and operations consultant, editing by Richard Humwe. Our voice actors today were Dakota Love and Yannick Laurie. Guys, we love your work. Special thanks to our series sponsor, Zondervan, for making this Underception possible. Undeceptions is the flagship podcast of Undeceptions.com, letting the truth out. An Undeceptions podcast. Meanwhile, philosopher David Benatar, the husband of the wonderful pop icon Pat Benatar, is that <laughs> not really? I was, I, was so so <laughs> I was so thrown by that. I thought, wow. So was Alice. I was like, how do I not know this? Like, <laughs>